Good evening, everybody. I hope everything is working fine. <coughs> Welcome to the 13th astronaut panel of ISU. Why can I say it very easily? I don't have to count because we're 30 years old. Certainly <laughs> here. So every year we try to find the number of astronauts, we, by preference, which have a link with ISU, uh, International Space University. I will be the moderator today. Uh, my name is Walter Peters. I'm the president of ISU, but in a previous life, long time ago, I was also involved in astronaut business for many years at the European Astronaut Center. So we try to have always a nice mixture of different astronauts with different backgrounds in order to accommodate your questions. On the question before I forget, it is a little bit dark here. So what we suggest as a very pragmatic thing, if you have a question, can you use your telephone? <laughs> and use the telephone to, to wave ah. that you have a question. That's always a very pragmatic ah. and easy way because we are blinded here and uh, we cannot see it very easily. So let me introduce you five astronauts. Four who are here and one who is here in spirit with us. The four astronauts we are very happy to have this year is uh, first of all Soyeon Yi. She is. <laughs> she is a biotechnologist by training, uh, was also at the same time the first Korean, and of course the first Korean woman who flew in space. She made one mission to the uh, uh, Mir station. Afterwards, she also made an MBA. So uh, I think she's going to change her career now very soon. <laughs> uh, what is the link of Soyun to ISU? It's very simple. Uh, Soyun is an alumnus. She was sitting where you, most of our uh, participants are now sitting a few years ago in 2009. She did the SSP. So that's a very obvious link. The second uh, lady I would like to uh, present to you is uh, Nicole Stott. Nicole has a master's degree in engineering management. She did uh, two space flights to make it relatively short. I would say one shorter one with a shuttle and then a long duration space flight to the International Space Station. Nicole is also known as the artistic astronaut. <laughs> Why? I think, as far as I know, you were the first astronaut who were painting in space. So she made the painting in space. And in fact, she loves art so much that now, after her astronaut career, she is starting a professional artist career, as a, uh, which I think is very nice to see the interdisciplinarity which we try to anyway uh, promote in our university. What is the link with ISU? Well, the link in this case is very, very strong because she is married to Christot, who is a, a member of the board of ISU and a lecture which you will meet also tomorrow evening. Then we go to our, uh, our gentleman, Dan Tani. <laughs> a bit of a similar uh, profile as Nicole, two space flights uh, after uh, obtaining engineering degrees, one shorter with the space shuttle and then a long-term space flight on the International Space Station. Uh, he's now also lecturing at ISU. Now, in the case of Dan, the, the, the link with ISU is a little bit indirect because his spouse is from Cork, so there is also a link <laughs> <laughs> indirectly. <laughs> and then we have... Uh, uh, an astronaut who has done us the pleasure many times already to be in the panel. We're very grateful for that. Uh, Bob Tursk from Canada. <laughs> Similar pattern. First, a shorter flight on board of the shuttle and then a long duration flight on the International Space Station. Now, one specificity from uh, Bob that might be interesting. I don't want to uh, create a question here, but what might be interesting, that means that he went up 
in space with two different vehicles, one with the Russian system and one with the shuttle. So it can compare very nicely the two uh, aspects. One point which is for you, in particular the ISU participants, and Bob knows that I'm going to say it because I say it very often, uh, you cannot have a better example of somebody who's interdisciplinary than Bob Tursk. It, you have the, in this person, Bob Tursk, which is a fantastic lecturer. And why is he a fantastic lecturer? Because he has degrees in engineering, he's a medical doctor, and he has an MBA. So how, where do you find all these capacities in one person? <laughs> Of course, every event, and I, I should not forget that, every event is only possible by people helping us, people sponsoring us. Uh, there are many. I just want to highlight two. Uh, first of all, because of the 4th of July special day, thanks, we thank the American Embassy, who is uh, sponsoring this event partially. And I would also like to, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, our main proponent is here, I would like to thank the County Council, uh, Mr. Ford, if he's here. Mr. Ford, thank you very much, we heard a lot about, <laughs> about your, uh, your very appreciated uh, participation. As I already announced, there is another astronaut who is not here because due to, as you know now from the lectures, probably well, from uh, Bob Tursk also, he is in what we call the prophylactorium in Russia. That means the place where you have to be a while before you go to space. So he will go soon to space. He wanted to be here. His name is Paolo, Paolo Nespoli. He's an ESA astronaut from Italian uh, origin, so an Italian nationality. He flew already two times, once with a shuttle, once with ISS, again, same <laughs> pattern, so there is a sort of continuity in the pattern. <laughs> And for many, many times, he was at the astronaut panel representing uh, and, and answering questions. He really regrets that he cannot be there. However, his next flight is on the 28th of July. So that's a little bit close for astronauts to travel around in the world. So he has to be uh, still in Star City. However, I could convince him to make a message, which we videotaped. and. Uh, as I already said to Niall and my friends, and maybe also to you, Mr. Ford, I would draw your attention to the end of the video because there's a very nice surprise for CIT and Cork in the video. Can we have the video at the moment? Hi, I'm Paolo Nespoli, Italian astronaut of the European Space Agency, and I'm talking to you from space. Well, no, not exactly. I am in Star City, Russia, on the simulator of the Russian segment in the final stage of preparation for the next expedition 5253, which will take place in, uh, in a couple of weeks. And so, so unfortunately, because of this, I'm here in uh, quarantine in Star City, soon to go to Baikonur, and I cannot be with you tonight on this astronaut panel. In the past years, uh, Walter Peters, ISU president, but also colleague and dear friend, invited me many times to come and talk to you and talk about space, talk uh, what we, about what we do in space, talk about the International Space Station and the future of space. And I always, always enjoyed meeting you and feeling your interest and your force and your enthusiasm, things that, that I, I really need to. Uh, but tonight, today I cannot, I cannot be with you, so I'm sending you this message. Uh, the astronaut panel there sees uh, very good friends too, uh, Nicole, uh, Dan, uh, So Young, and, uh, and who else is there? Uh, Bob, Bob Tursk, uh, on my astronaut class. Uh, hello, I would like, uh, I would have loved to be there with you, but I'm, I'm sure you're going you're gonna to be really funny and nice. In any case, to the 112 uh, participants of SSP15, I really wish you a very good time, a very interesting time, and a time where you can actually look at the future. Sorry I cannot be with you, but I'm pretty sure some of you in the future will be where I am now, when I will be in a few weeks. Uh, one thing I, uh, Walter Peter sent to me to bring in space is the beautiful uh, uh, banner and flag of uh, the city of Cork and the uh, Cork Institute of Technology 
and of course the one of ISU. These are just pieces of paper because the real flag are already stored in the vehicle, ready to go to space. I'll be back and I will get back to you. Meanwhile, enjoy and uh, let, uh, let's go in space. Ciao. What I propose, uh, well, I'm not proposing it because we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> uh, the way we're going to run it is as follows. I'm going to just give you the time to think about interesting questions, probably you already did. But I'm going to ask a question to all the four panelists and that gives you the time to come up with, uh, and then for the rest of the, of the event, you will be the people who are going to put the questions, the very interesting questions. So, what I was wondering, because all of four of them have been in space, in different vehicles, they have uh, seen different systems, so I, I wondered <laughs> what do they think uh, will be a big, big challenge if once humanity wants to go to Mars? What will be the big challenge for the astronauts? Soyon, what do you think? <laughs> Whenever I got on the question, would you really want to go? Answer yes. And then one day my mom literally hit me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so biggest challenge of mine is, of course, my mom. <laughs> but next is, I think most of biggest challenge would be kind of mental readiness because we've never done that long duration flight before, even if we're watching the movie and everything. And of course, a lot of people is ready for all long duration flight, but maybe first person would be hard time to get through all long time to get there and then touch and then coming back because all we astronauts are a little more accustomed to have a right communication with the Earth. Whatever happened, we can have communication right away. Even if we have a delay several seconds, in, under this technology, we cannot even bear the one or two second delay, <laughs> but in, to the mass, it will be longer. And whatever happened, it's harder to rescue them and then bring them back. Of course, through the brain, we know, because when we watch the movie, they let us know. But once we face it, maybe we would feel totally differently. So I can think of those things first. Nicole, is that also your perspective? Or? Well, I, you know, I think I'll follow along with that because I remember before flying the first time, which was going to be my long duration flight. And I remember being very um, diligent about preparing the, um, the technical side of things that need to come in. I want to make sure in my, my notebook I had all the things for when I was going to capture the HTV mm -hmm. and we had all of that information, you know, the, all the technical side. And I have this very vivid memory of uh, one of our ground support team. Um, people who, wonderful, and she, she reminded me, she's like, Nicole, you're going to be up there for, you know, several months, you know, what, what are you thinking you'll do in your spare time? And, uh, and, you know, I thought, well, you know, there's stuff to do. I've been looking out the window, taking pictures, you know, <laughs> talking on the phone to my family, which, you know, won't necessarily be able to happen when you're traveling to Mars, at least in a timely way. And that's when, um, this whole idea of the fact that you're living and working there. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not just working there, you, you are living there. And to me, uh, I think for that mission I did, this, you know, ultimately I brought a paint kit and I painted and that, that became something very different to me in that, in that environment. Uh, I think those same kinds of things are gonna have to be considered when we're flying, you know, nine months to uh, another planet, when we're there for some extended period of time, hopefully not just touching, <laughs> coming back, and then, you know, the return trip. Because to me, as soon as that Earth goes out of view, it's going to be a very, very different experience to what we and all of human spaceflight have experienced so far. And I think we need to be very aware of ourselves and how, you know, what we enjoy, how we'll figure out to communicate with our families, how we'll spend that free time, because there will be a lot of it, you know, in that, in that time to Mars. That's correct. Uh, correct. Dan? Well, <coughs> well that's, your uh, Placion and, and Nicole are going down this path that I've, I've been thinking of also, uh, 
But one, one of the things is crew mix. I've always thought that crew mix is going to be a very interesting dilemma for mm -hmm. these long and isolated missions. And uh, it, it, what's the number of people? What's the gender mix? What's the relationship bef of the people before they go? It, it, you can almost think there's no good answer there. So, so I would have thought several years ago that that was going to be a big challenge. But now, through the ISS experience with six month rot rotation, six month uh, missions, none of that's ever been an issue. So maybe that won't be that much of an issue, even for a four year, three or four year uh, mission. Um, but building on what Nicole said, assuming the vehicle is just getting to Mars and, and assuming the vehicle is relatively healthy, on the surface there's not much for the crew to do. And so I had, we were actually talking about training up while we were uh, having dinner here. And one of the thoughts I had was, you know, if you have 10 months with pretty much nothing to do, maybe what we should do is we should train the crew. That's training period. So mm -hmm. we should not train them for what they're going to do on Mars. We should just give them all the training material or ship it up to them or beam it up to them. And that's their job. Their job for 10 months is to train to go live on Mars. And so that might be a useful, uh, useful work uh, for this uh, duration yeah. when they get there. And, uh, I just thought that might be a, a clever use of that time other, because I think you can drive yourself crazy if you, had, you did not have useful work in that time. It's certainly a very creative uh, proposal. I never heard, but a very, very creative. <laughs> well, I think you, not to interrupt, but I think you were a proponent of that for space station yeah. too, for uh, you know real time. And Bob and I experienced it on the station with with one of the investigations that we had. There was so much that you could just learn right there with the equipment. You had the the skills training already, yeah. and then you just applied it to new things. And I, I think that'd be I'm awesome. a big so yeah. We were talking this, about this before or upstairs and. Yeah, right now space station training is two and a half years, and I'd be honest, that whatever you learn in that first two years and two months, you're gonna pretty much forget. And then, so I, I believe I believe that space station training should be six months, and then, uh, and because we as astronauts have a, a good set of basic skills that, mm -hmm. that we learn just by osmosis, and uh, the particular skills we should learn on orbit. Anyway, yeah. you're right, that's, that's, I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, for the participants, this is not a lesson. Eh? Don't forget the core lectures. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see already. Uh, That's not true in grad school. <laughs> yes. I see Still it coming. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Bob, what do you think? Well, I think this new era of human spaceflight is going to be absolutely incredible. And uh, when we go to Mars, it's going to be the story of the 21st century. It's going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal year when that happens. Uh, being a medical doctor, I think about some of the medical obstacles that are that are out there, and. Um, there's a number of issues that we have to get more serious about, and one is ionizing radiation, like X-rays and gamma rays. Uh, X-rays, of course, are exposed to high fluxes, can um, damage DNA, damage the cell matrices within, within your body. And, um, you know, like when we live here on Earth, uh, we measure um, radiation dosage in a unit called sieverts. So here on Earth, we're exposed to like five milli sieverts per year. It's negligible just from natural sources. Uh, where we fly, 400 kilometers up, it's higher dose, so it's about three, 300 millisieverts per year. Uh, the Mars mission will expose uh, those crew members to at least one sievert, or 1,000 millisieverts, on a, on a round trip, on, on a good trip. And if, heaven forbid, uh, there's a major solar flare that occurs during that trip, it could be uh, five sieverts. Um, there's a 50% mortality rate if you're exposed it, within one month if you're exposed to five sieverts. So we have to get really serious in the future about providing better shielding of uh, spacecraft and uh, habitats against ionizing radiation. Aboard the space station, uh, the back end of the, the station's got a little bit more hardware there, so that's where we would go as a safe haven if there was a, a solar storm. But it's sort of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It doesn't really do a whole lot of good. Uh, we have to get better about that. Um, People are saying, asking me, well, Bob, why don't you build a spacecraft out of lead? Well, you, <laughs> you can't launch it. <laughs> so, I mean, that would work if we, could, if we could launch it. So we have to get smart about shielding and then also maybe chemical um, radio protectants as well. Like if we are exposed to radiation, is there something we can ingest or a medication that we can take that can correct the, uh, the damage to our cells and to our, our DNA? All of us, uh, because we've flown on the, the space station, have been exposed to ionizing radiation, we are at slightly, slightly higher risk of developing cataracts in our eyes, of developing uh, genetic mutations 
and also um, certain types of cancers, uh, thyroid cancer, that would be a, a good example. So again, low Earth orbit, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the Mars mission, it's a, it'll be a serious problem. Yeah, sure, sure. It's a bit difficult to see here with the uh, light in our eyes, but uh, is there anybody who has uh, a, a burning question already? I see it here, but I don't know where the microphone is. It's okay, I can speak all No, that's very difficult for the people in the back to hear it. Hmm? Yep. Um, so, uh, Maiden, sir, uh, I have uh, one question in particular in training, especially uh, then talk about training in Mars. So, uh, my question is actually during your long duration of astronaut training, is there any uh, most important or remarkable training you have done? And also, especially to them, what sort of training do you think is most appropriate to be trained like in the outer space, such as Mars? Thank you. I don't have to pick somebody as it was to you, Dan? Uh, if I, if I remember and understand your question uh, correctly. Um, in terms of train, when I look back at the, the years of training that I spent for going to the International Space Station, uh, I think the most valuable two weeks I had was uh, we contracted, NASA contracted with an or organization in the States called National Outdoor Leadership School, and they teach um, leadership through, I would call it rugged camping. So, uh, you go out and you learn how to, uh, uh, we did, uh, we hiked the canyons of, of uh, the deserts of America, of you know, the western states, and um, it, was a, it was so interesting, and to, to, first of all, to do the hiking and then rely on each other as a team, and also they have a curriculum of leadership, and we learned about leadership skills and what it means to be a leader and, and all those things. That was so valuable and has still continues to be valuable in my career and my life. I, I carry that with me. The other training we get, which is technical training for space station, is uh, uh, useful and it's good to know the voltage that comes out of the solar rays. It's good to know how the computers are, are networked together. Um, but we're not primary, primarily responsible for that when we're living on the space station. So that's part of my comment of uh, I, we think, I think that space station training just takes too long and it's too much of the technical details. And um, um, so now I'm trying to think there was another part of the question that you were, you were asking me. Uh, my second question will be, uh, if you mentioned about spending the time such as Mars on Mars can be the time for astronauts for further training what sort of uh, training will be appropriate for the astronaut to pick up new knowledge or learning on, in outer space such as Mars for like 10 months? Boy, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to that. Do you have, do you have any? Well, I think, I think when, we, when we go to Mars, at least in our initial missions, um, I think we're going to be operating a lot like we do right now on the space station, where it, you don't have the luxury of the medical doctor, the plumber, the scientist, the, you know, and so each crew member has to still operate in that jack of all trades kind of way. And I think it'll be even more important um, when, we're, when we're going to Mars. And when we don't have the opportunity to communicate with our ground teams the way we do now, when our vehicles really are designed more I think for autonomous operation, but when something does go wrong, it will be dependent on the crew to, you know, to, to really be intimately involved with the troubleshooting and the, the repair of whatever happens. And so I think there'll be a little bit of a shift in the focus on what, what we train, although it might be a lot like what we already do, but we may actually use it. Right. And <laughs> but I think we're gonna be in that, that condition where we just are, um, having to be the person that can do everything, really. And I will echo what you said, Dan. I, you know, I did the Knowles training as well. And I think when we talk about going to, to Mars, the other kind of training that we'll, we'll need to do, you need to have an understanding not only of your crew members' strengths and weaknesses, but of your own. 
And when you go into a, an environment that's very different like that, that has its own challenges, I would also throw in the underwater missions that we do, the, these missions called NEMO, where we go and we live in a like one module, space station sized module habitat underwater for a couple weeks at a time, uh, where you really, you can't just swim to the surface to, to escape if something's going on. Uh, that kind of environment puts you in a place where you really do have to understand yourself and how you will respond to things. And I think our training has done such a good job with where, where we are with Space Station right now. Bob and I flew together and I thought one of the coolest things was when we had one of those middle of the night alarms go off and we all float out of our crew, our crew compartment and it was, it was almost like magic that everybody was responding in the way we had responded on the ground to emergency training. And, you know, Bob was on the, the comms and <laughs> Frank was on the procedure and we made sure everybody was where they were supposed to be. And it's really neat to see how that can work even in a, an unusual environment like space. I can tell whoever will go first, maybe him or she, he or she would have a more than enough training than any other next person because Remembering my training in Russia, some of the machines not used anymore because they realized that we don't need it. But first generation of astronaut, they do all of that. And when I feel so envious, is until me, we did a rotating chair thing and I throw up every time. <laughs> but after four months, they realized that it doesn't help at all, so they just stopped doing it. Oh my God, I did it, but why they don't do it? <laughs> So maybe first Martian astronaut would have much more training than necessary because we don't know what happens. So maybe we want to have a backup and backup and backup thing. So he or she would be have a really hard time for training, I believe. Yeah. By the way, may I also encourage the the guests here, not only the participants. You, you feel free also to ask questions. It's not only for the participants, for all of us eh? and for all of you. Do I have another question? I see, I see a lot of lights. I think I'm, I think I'm, I i did not make a good remark with the with the telephones because it looks like. Uh, so I don't know where the microphone is. There are a few lights here. We can't see anything. Yeah, all the way. And at the end. So, can can we bring a microphone to one you know, of the lighting people? While we're waiting for that question, too, I got to follow on with Su Young because yeah. um, being trained for more than what, what you think you'll need. What I always loved was the line uh, when we would ask the question, um, well, don't we need to have, know, know how to repair this or to um, manipulate this valve or whatever it was? And it's, oh, no, you, that will never break and you'll never have to touch <laughs> no, that. that never <laughs> and I don't know how many times we had to get behind a pa panel that you never, ever yeah, were supposed to have right. to get behind. <laughs> and when you think about not having the ground to communicate with about something like that, it'll be really interesting. Yeah. Where's the microphone? Yep. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, my name is Marcel, and uh, I had the honor to meet Nicole and her husband Chris 10 years ago at a program called International Space School. Yeah. And um, I'm very honored to be here tonight, uh, taking part as a participant uh, at SSP. And um, I would like you to expand on the importance of STEAM education. Also, the others uh, can join this question. Thanks. Bob, you were silent on the previous question, but uh, yeah, so that, you were meditating. The, yeah. the question is um, to expand on this uh, type of education, style of education we call STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and, um, and math. Uh, the, the foundational pillars for International Space University is something we call the three I's, so international, intercultural experience, and interdisciplinary. Uh, I'm a strong, strong believer of this kind of uh, education because number one, it's experiential, it's hands-on, and it's bringing people from dissimilar uh, backgrounds together to address problems. So the cutting edge innovative teams today are cross-disciplinary. So we all have one of these things here. It's engineers, it's uh, social uh, sociologists that came together for, um, for this, it's mathematicians, it's artists, uh, it's lifestyle uh, designers that came together to design this. The greatest innovations in our nation are uh, based on cross-disciplinary teams coming together. 
I could have given this task to a group of engineers, the solution would have looked quite a bit, bit different, and I don't think quite as, uh, as useful. Um, the same thing in spaceflight as well. When we talk about uh, going to Mars, think about the habitats. We can build a habitat uh, based on uh, design inputs from just architects, but if you also get in the people from a sociological perspective, get in the engineers, get in past astronauts who have uh, already flown, uh, get in the medical specialists as well, you come up with a better solution. So STEAM education, where you bring in the, the technical and the scientific folks and add them together with the artistic and humanistic and sociological folks will always result in a, in a better uh, result. And ISU, International Space University, is founded on that, that principle. And that's why today, of the 4,000 alumni that we have of International Space University, they're out there in the world and they're making a difference. Thank you, Bob. Where do I see the next slide coming up? I saw one here uh, and in the back. Let's leave it up to the camera people, uh, to the microphone people. Hello. Sorry, the question relates to, you know, for many, thousands of years, people looked up in space for generations through mankind and you guys get the opportunity to go up and look down. Not too many get that opportunity. And I'm just wondering, from a personal point of view, did it have a moment when you were reflecting, looking out that window, where something in your mind, you just suddenly realized how fragile we all are? Or was there any you know, big change in your attitudes to you know, different things down on Earth? <clears throat> Nicole, I think you already mentioned that, uh, that it, it triggered something in your mind. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Uh, I, I will not speak for the other three people or even for Paulo, um, who was with us earlier, but I have to believe that every single one of us has been um, impacted in some way by this experience. I would say positively impacted um, by this experience. I know that uh, before I flew, I had, I, I think I had this idea in my mind what it would look like, what it would feel like really to, you know, to see our home planet from space, and it's just like launch. What I thought maybe ended, it was here was like, you know, more than I can extend my arm. And just, just overwhelmingly, stunningly beautiful. And, and that stays all the time. I think you, you can't look out the window and not, I mean, look at that picture right there without just seeing the beauty in it. And this glowing, colorful planet that we all share. And I think it's, um, ultimately, it's about you know, separating yourself in a way and seeing something that you think you know really well and seeing it from a whole new vantage point, a whole new perspective. And it, you don't even have to go to space to have that happen. There's, you, know, you can go on, venture outside of your local town and experience things differently and appreciate them, I think, in a new and different way. And for me, it really comes down to Seeing Earth as this place that we all share, um, understanding even more that we're responsible to the planet, you know, for its, its survival, which is ultimately about our mutual survival here on it. And, uh, and I could talk all night about this subject, but <laughs> I, I really believe that that's inherent to the, to the experience. It's, it's inherent to separating yourself from something you know, that you think you know really well, and seeing it from a new perspective. Dan, you were working now in Japan. Is that a, limp, a, a link with, uh, with your space experience, that you also had a more global view? Uh, well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so, let's see. First, to add a little bit to N Nicole's comments, I, uh, uh, if, if anybody was at my lecture last week, uh, the message that I tell after my experience in space is that you know we all have associations and loyalties in our life to our town and to our school and to our... And so we feel different citizenships. And my overwhelming sense coming back to, from space is that uh, my, the top priority is now I'm a citizen of this planet. And it, it overwhelms my, my sense of citizenship to other associations. And I wish that, every, I wish I, that many other people could share that. that. And just to look out the window, it's hard to not to, to feel that. Um, the, I guess it's actually building on what Bob was talking about, uh, inter, international and uh, uh, the, the value of, of uh, intercultural. Um, uh, about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, 
Uh, I've, my wife and I talked about the importance of getting our children a different perspective on life. We were in a very comfortable life in, in America, and uh, uh, we've, we both felt that it would be very valuable for us to be someplace else in the world for a while, and so we uh, created and took an opportunity to go to Japan and, and live outside of Tokyo in a, in a house one-fifth the size of our house in America and uh, uh, take trains and bikes everywhere instead of driving. And it's been a great experience for us. And uh, hopefully my children will feel uh, 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 not unicultural, but multicultural. And then that I, I can only think that, that will help them uh, develop that later in their, their lives. So we're, we're really enjoying uh, being in Japan and, and exposing our children and ourselves to, to another Jeez. culture. Thanks for that intercultural perspective, uh, Soya. Yeah, actually, I got a question when I looked down to the earth first time in my first time in my life, why I was born in that country. That was my first question because I grew up in South Korea, and then as a person who grew up and always lived in South Korea, I believe South Korea is not that small. But once I go up and I look down to the earth, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting until I could see the South Korean peninsula. And finally I see it and then drink, I grab the photo, bring it back and then ready for camera already passed there. <laughs> so, <laughs> and my Russian friends right next to me, oh, PD Soyeon, and you should wait another 90 minutes to take a photo of your country. And I realized that, oh my God, such a small country I was born and grew up, but I thought like that was my whole world. And next question is, then why I was born in there as an engineer, as a technical people, thinking about probability to be born in some place all around the earth, and then to be born in South Korea is a really, really, really low probability, even lower probability to be a national among the 36,000 people, right? So, wow, why and how? And then right after that, I'm so grateful to be born in there because what if I were born in the middle of the Afni Afghanistan? What if I were born in the middle of Africa? What if I were born in, in the middle of the China? Or what if I were born in, in the middle of Kazakhstan? And then may maybe my life would be totally changed. But I didn't do anything to be born in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> but I were born, it's not fair if there's a kids who were born in the middle of the Afghanistan. How, how unfair it is to be born in there because she, he even doesn't do anything for that. So I have a huge regret right after that. Oh my God, I've never feel grateful for that moment. Even if there was the biggest game changing thing for my life. And then after, what if I were born in that place, not in 1978, but in 1910, under the Japanese era, like my grandma? Yeah. Then maybe I even cannot read and write because I'm a Korean girl who will never go into the school. And that is also not my choice, but I have a huge blessing for that. And so that was the biggest mindfulness moment of my life when I was in space. Yeah. Very nice philosophical thoughts. So, uh, where are we now? Lights everywhere. <laughs> When you were in space, was everything black or did you see loads of junk like broken sunlights and old space shuttles and stuff? Can you tell us who you are and how old you are? That's a very interesting question. Yeah? Oh, um, my name is Kaylin. I'm 10 years of age. Aha. Uh -huh. So uh, did anybody qu uh, catch the question? No, no not 100%. I think I... I got it. So are you asking, uh, when we looked out the window when we were in space, did everything see, seem black? And also, do we see any space junk or other objects in space? Is that what you were asking? Was, was it like just black, or did you see loads of junk floating around in space? Ooh, that's a... Excellent <laughs> question. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, so when we, um, we looked out the, the window uh, at the sky, of course, it, uh, it was black, it was pitch black, because there's no atmosphere up there, there's no diffraction of light taking um, place up there, so the, the resulting background color of the sky is, is black. Of course, when we look down at the, the planet below, uh, it was multicolored. When, before I had launched the first time, I thought that when I was gonna pass over deserts, that'd be a good time to go back to work. It's not, <laughs> not, bother, not worth looking at deserts, because deserts are brown. But deserts are brown, but they're 100 shades of brown. They're 100 shades of yellow, 100 textures, 
100 shades of orange, 100 shades of, of red. So deserts were, were, were beautiful to look at. So our beautiful planet down below is uh, multicolored. Um, when we're uh, looking out the window at nighttime, that is when the sun is on the far side of the Earth and everything is, is black, you can start to see stars then uh, as well. Perhaps even a little bit brighter than you'd see them on a night here in, uh, in Cork. And the other thing, too, is that when you look at the stars from space, they don't twinkle. It's like a steady, bright beam of, uh, of light. Again, because there's no atmosphere uh, in, in space. So uh, the sky is black. The Earth is beautiful, multicolored um, object down below that's just absolutely transfixing. And then, um, yes, once in a while we'd see junk uh, floating out near the, the station. I'd be at the window and say, Nicole, what is that? Bit? And it'd be like a, a piece of foam that was uh, going by or a, a tether that was flowing by. But if you're asking about um, uh, space junk, like space debris, like an old satellite, an old rocket, no, those move way too fast. Uh, they'd, be go they'd be past us in, a, in the blink of, of an eye. Those are dangerous. Uh, if they do impact the space station, they can create a big hole, which would make a bad day for us. Uh, uh, for those of us aboard. <laughs> but the mission control on the ground is tracking all of those dangerous pieces of space debris that are whizzing by. And uh, they will call up to us every once in a while and say, tomorrow uh, a piece, piece of space debris is going to pass worrisomely close to the station and we're going to boost the station up a few kilometers so the debris will pass below you. So that happened two or three times and uh, the ground is, is uh, helping, us to, helping to protect us. Can I, One, I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll say it. Hey, it's the same yeah, thing. It might be the same thing. <laughs> One thing, if, uh, if you look up at the night sky and there's no clouds, sometimes you'll see what some people call shooting stars, mm -hmm. like Absolutely. a micrometeorite, and that's, a, that's some piece of, uh, not debris, but some piece of a rock or something mm -hmm. that is re-entering the, that is, I'm sorry, entering the Earth's atmosphere and then is burning up and becoming bright. The cool thing from the station is that if you get to see one, uh, it's, you, between you and Earth, so they're below you. So the shooting stars are below you as you look down at night, and that's a cool thing to see is, is, a, is a shooting star coming under you uh, as you look down. And that, to, to follow on that, the thing which goes to what Bob was saying too, is that, I mean, I remember seeing that for the first time, and nobody told me that that was yeah. going to happen. So there's these things that nobody tells you is going to happen. You look out the window, you see it, it looks beautiful, you know, you float down to Bob and say, Bob, what the heck was that? <laughs> Bob tells you, and, and then you go back and you look for more. Of course, you're probably not right. going to see Just another one right away, but you start thinking about it, and it's like, wow, that was really, really beautiful, and wow. I'm really glad that didn't hit my spaceship. Right. If yeah. I can yeah. see it, it didn't hit my spaceship. Yeah. Bob, you want to add something on that? Well, speaking of um, things that no one told us about before <laughs> first flight, <laughs> my first flight was on the shuttle and um, had a great first day. Went to bed that night and uh, closed the door on my, my sleep station and um, started to drift off to sleep. And all of a sudden, I saw poof, a flash of light in my eye, like, like a lightning bolt. Oh, that's odd. And then about two or three minutes later, poosh, I saw another flash of light in my eye, or in my eye like, like fireworks. And I thought, oh my God, my retina is detaching. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this kept happening every five minutes or so. So I went to see my commander and said, Tom, we've got to abort the mission. My retina is <laughs> detaching. We have to get to the earth. And he said, well, what's, what's wrong? And I said, well, I'm seeing these flashes of light in my eyes. He started to laugh. So what it is, as I mentioned earlier, we live in a, a radiation environment that has higher fluxes than here on Earth. It's ionizing radiation coming in, hitting a rod or a cone in the back of my retina of the eye and exciting it. So I see these flashes. So uh, no one told me about that <laughs> before my first flight and got, flight and, and that got me quite uh, worried that, that first night. Um, of course, uh, after the first night, you get used to it. You see it every night. You just ignore it and you fall asleep um, and with, without any problem. <laughs> Okay. It's a whole list of Great story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anybody here while I'm checking some Twitter questions? Thank you very much, Remco. At the back, somebody's going to... Um, so a lot of innovations that we have here on Earth uh, come from space programs. And I was wondering if there's any gadget that you guys think is really, really cool that they have aboard the ISS now that maybe wasn't there 10 years ago, or anything that you think 
and um, it might be coming in the next few years or that's a problem that needs to be solved on the ISS. Nicole, I think you you well, go place for that. Bob has one too, but I think the one that comes to mind immediately for me is the 3D printer mm -hmm. that's on board station. And um, while we haven't, you know, printed out anything critical yet to operations there, uh, we have a 3D printer on board. And it's what's interesting about it, just from having the 3D printer there, is that the technology, just like regular ink printers too. Um, we just kind of take those for granted down here now. And it took a lot for them to get the printer that prints out our procedures and things to work in space, just the way the inks are and how it you know, distributes it when you do the printing. And the same thing was true for the 3D printer, whether you're building it from kind of the coiled stock or powder or you know, the, little, the sheets of material that go in, it's a very different process when it's in space and what they are in microgravity at least and what they've shown they've they've done this very successfully and I remember when they asked they did kind of a poll around the office well if you were going to 3d print something in space what would it be and I had three things one was a spoon because we always eat I mean the pretty much the only utensil we use is like a long handled spoon and, I, and if you lose that spoon you're very sad because then you don't have anything to eat you're delicious food with. <laughs> and the second was the, um, the belt or the buckle on the weight or on the uh, strap that went on the bench for the exercise device because that seemed to, to break a lot. And then the third was a urine funnel. Because, and these three things were all very, you know, there's, very, there's utility and purpose to all three of these. And, uh, and I'm sure in the future we'll be 3D printing a lot, you know, more critical and important things. but. Those three things stood out as, as something that would be really good to print right now. But to me, the idea of us having a 3D printer in space, thinking about what we're going to do when we go to Mars, how are we going to, or sending 3D printers ahead of us to Mars to build mm. bricks to make habitats out of or to cover ourselves with and um, to build those things that we'll need once we get there. I heard your question, and you asked if there's any cool Earth technologies that have made their, their way to the space station, and 3D printing is a good example of that. But I'd like to flip your question around and give you a different answer about cool technologies from the space program that have made their way to Earth. Um, my country, Canada, has contributed the robotics to the space shuttle program and also to the International Space Station. And um, my university, the University of Calgary, has uh, partnered with the manufacturer of the, the Canada arm, the, the robot arm, uh, called MD Robotics, with the Canadian Space Agency and a marketing company in, in a city called Winnipeg. And they've developed a neural arm, uh, a robot arm, based on the computer algorithms, based on some of the gearing mechanisms of the uh, joints of the, the Canada arm, and also the vision system as well, to make a two meter long uh, robot arm that does neurosurgery. And why do you want to build a robot arm to do neurosurgery? Well, a robot arm has the same dexterity as the best neurosurgeon's hand, but it's more precise and it's tremor-free as well. So uh, using NeuroArm at our um, local hospital, we've uh, done over 100 operations uh, to date, removing tumors, brain tumors, correcting um, arterial venous malformations, and then removing blockages associated with hydrocephalus as well. So I think that's one of the best examples of mm -hmm. space technology that has spun off to improve life here on, on Earth. Yep, thank you, Bob. We have a number of people looking at this, and uh, it, I'm very pleased to have a, a question out of Saudi Arabia. Oh. That's very unusual. Uh, maybe Dan, something, because you talked about the global. I, I read the question, all agencies have programs to go to Mars. Why don't they collaborate more and do one big global mission? <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm convinced that eventually we're going to get to Mars. Uh, I think that's inevitable. The path and how and who uh, we get there is going to be messy. Uh, it's going to be very expensive, and so there's going to be financial buy-in from whoever, uh, whoever, whatever the organization is and whoever is a member of that organization. And so there's going to be, and it's a very long project. So there's going to be a financial uh, uh, support and a commitment, long-time commitment uh, for that financial support to get that going. 
Um, and so, um, uh, I, I've just lost track of the question though. What's the, why, right? Why, yeah. Why, all together? Why, why not all together? Like a more global international. Thing. Why it has to be, well, yeah. I, I, I think, well, I think it has to be global because I don't think any one country can, will be able to afford the, the expense or the resources to do that. And so, and I think it's appropriate that it's, a, it's an international, if we're, if we're one planet traveling to another planet, I think it's absolutely um, appropriate that it's a, it's a, it's a fully international uh, mission to go to, to another planet. And so I think it's just going to have to be that way. There's, I don't think there's any one country that's going to have the resources to, to be able to commit to such Absolutely. a huge mission. Absolutely. Thank you. Where are we with the questions? Oops, the light go up. Oh, look, there's a lot of people. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> waving frantically over there. So. Yeah. yeah, they haven't gotten over that way. Uh, can we have the camera here? The uh, young lady. Hmm? Um, what's the difference between Saturn V and shuttles today? Difference between? The difference between? Saturn V and shuttles today. Saturn V and the shuttle? Biggest rocket on Earth. Is the, is the question, what's the difference between, I heard, the Saturn V and the shuttle? Is that correct? Today. Yes, yes. To shuttles today. Shuttles today. Well, I'll start. I'll start. So, uh, the shuttle is the name of a particular rocket yeah. that was uh, that was built by NASA, and the shuttle is there's a big airplane-looking thing. And so, when we say shuttle, we we talk about the space shuttle, and it's this a particular rocket that both launched into space and then orbited, and sometimes deployed satellites or built the space station, and then came back and landed like an airplane. Saturn V was a particular rocket that was built. Particular, uh, specifically to go to the moon. It's uh, an enormous 260-foot tall rocket. And um, uh, sort of unfortunately, you can go visit some of them, real flight units, because they never flew. But it's kind of cool to walk around them because they're so huge. So now we have other rockets that, that we're, we're making. Uh, there's a, there are many companies, actually, that are making rockets right now. A couple of them are making rockets for people with the intent of launching people into space. Uh, NASA is working on a rocket that will launch uh, a very large rocket based on some of the space shuttle parts that will launch astronauts, hopefully to an asteroid or Mars eventually, moon, to further out. And so um, there are many, many, many rockets being made, and they all look pretty much the same, but, but uh, have different particular, uh, different design uh, uh, features based on the mission that they're going to Fulfill. Can I have a microphone here in the in front? Because we have a young lady very interested <laughs> in a, and I would be very interested in, in yeah. hearing your question of the young day, lady. Is it hard to get to sleep in a re after re after a really exciting day in space? <laughs> Is it hard to get to sleep after a really oh after hard a really day hard day in space? space? <laughs> Best sleep ever. Best sleep ever. Best sleep ever. So before my agree. first flight, I worried whether or not I'd be able to sleep in space because uh, I am what I call a finicky sleeper on Earth. So the only way I can fall asleep on Earth is if I'm lying on my left side with a pillow here and a pillow there. It's the only way I can fall asleep. So I was thinking, how can I do this in a weightless environment? And the first night I got to space, you, or you heard me tell the other story, except for these flashes in my eyes. Uh, I was asleep within 10 minutes. It wasn't an issue. Because you get inside your, your sleeping bag, and you relax, and then your arms and your legs drift up into a position like that, and your head goes over like the that. The second also? <laughs> <laughs> um, what we need to do, though, is we need to put on uh, eye shades, uh, because uh, coming in through the windows every 45 minutes is sunlight. We're orbiting around the Earth uh, every 90 minutes, so 45 minutes in sunlight, 45 minutes in darkness, 45 minutes in sunlight, and 45 minutes in darkness. So if you're sleeping out in the open, you have to put on eye shades. The other thing I did is I had to put earplugs in my ears as well, because there's life support equipment, pumps and compressors and fans that are going all the time just to uh, give us a living environment, air to breathe, water to water to drink, and that's very, very noisy. So I put earplugs in at night just to give myself some rest. But 
in this position here, just floating like that, uh, it's the most comfortable way you can sleep. Some nights, uh, I didn't use my sleeping bag. Instead, I would just cross my legs, cross my arms, put on my eye shades, and I'd float throughout the night. <laughs> and it'd be interesting to find out when I woke up in the morning where I was. Because <laughs> I might be upside down, I might be in a module two over, and I wake up and think, where is this? <laughs> so it's, it's easy to sleep in space. The, the, in the back, there is a lot of fanatic waving, so I think we better stop it and, uh, in, and give the person a, a chance. Hmm? Um, so, my question is, when you came uh, back off the spaceship, did, was there anything that you want to change about your life from uh, the experience that you had when you were in space? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Who dares that? Well, I think, you know, it's based on some of what we all said uh. before, too, I think this, this appreciation, um, I think it puts you in a place where when you think about what you're going to do for the rest of your life, it's always kind of there. That, that experience you had, the, what you felt about it is always there. And so hopefully that plays into everything you do from that point on and, and the choices you make and the, the work you're involved in and those kinds of things. I think, I think that's really, well, really where one. it was for me. I've got a good one. You all good? <laughs> uh, when I came back from space and watched, looking out the window for months and months, I came back wanting to go to these fantastic places I've seen out the window. Absolutely. So <laughs> I, haven't been to, I have not been to the middle of Australia, but it yes. is unbelievably beautiful. And I would love to see what it looks like from the ground. And I've, I, um, I, would, I would love to go to the glaciers of Patagonia. There are these places that are, are, you look at from, from space. And first of all, you, it's amazing to look down and go, there's whole societies of people there that are living there, living their lives. And, and yet I just get to see it as this uh, uh, beautiful, image, right? But, uh, but I did want to explore our Earth more coming back uh, and see what it looks like here from the, from the ground. My case is already different because I was the first Korean astronaut. And before having flight, not many Korean people are interested in my flight or all the process. But once TV shows how I fly and how I go to the space and how I moving in a space and all the sudden whole Korean public is interested in me and my life and who I am. So before going to Russia, before having lunch, I'm just one of the Korean people. I'm just engineering school student. I'm just so young. But right after coming back, and everybody knows me even if I have no idea who those people is. <laughs> and when I enter to the Korean airport, open the gate, and all the people are waving me and then screaming at me. But I thought like maybe one of the celebrities right behind me. <laughs> it was even not me because I've never had those kind of experience before. And then hundred, hundred camera are looking at me and then even some airport security make a whole line and then make me go away. And then first my reaction, oh, it's not me. <laughs> maybe somebody is over there. <laughs> maybe some kind of huge first over there. But I saw my mom is almost crying right over there. Ah, oh, maybe me. So <laughs> that, of, of course, changed my life a lot. And then, but more like uh, changing myself, I feel like people changing before and after than me. And then there was a kind of huge changing. And then personally changing is, as I told you, yeah, I thought how grateful my life is, how grateful I was born there, how grateful I was born in this time. And then in the space station, I keep deciding, oh my God, when I go down, I should be more humble. I should be more grateful. Maybe I should be more happy, kind of like that. But once <laughs> getting down and then face a traffic jam, I'm starting complaining as I did before. <laughs> Almost like a people who every day complaining and then I always think, okay, I should be grateful for any situation, how bad day I have. But once some journalists make me feel so pissed and I almost say F words, and then I was not that changed. So I realized that, oh, I'm not that kind of changing even before and after. I'm still human kind of soy, and that was I found. <laughs> okay. 
I think we take another two questions and then we have to uh, close. Oh, the panic starts. Way over there. <laughs> way, way over there. Yes, that. Like all the way back. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, keep first. Yeah. <laughs> what you have to study in college? Um, what you have to study in college to be an astronaut? <laughs> uh, uh, I think Nicole, you're uh. you're deep to the STEM <laughs> STEM uh, education. Uh, yeah? I I think first of all, you have to study something that you know you're going to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I think you really and truly have to pay attention to what you enjoy. Now NASA or ESA or the Canadian Space Agency, the Korean Space Agency, or whatever country you're from, will have some basic requirements on you. And right now, it's mostly like an engineering or a science or a medical, you know, a technical based degree. Uh, and then they have some criteria about how much work experience you've had and of course medical, you know, medical um, criteria. But really and truly beyond that, it is wide open. Mm -hmm. and, and I love it. I have, I didn't put it in the slides tonight um, with the pictures, but I have a picture of my class. Uh, of astronauts, and we were selected in the year 2000, and we were the 18th group of astronauts, and there's 17 people in that picture. There's a, a 17, so there's three women and 14 men in that picture, but every single person in that picture got to the seat in that picture in a very different way. Everybody enjoyed what they studied in school, everybody loved the work they were doing um, after graduating from school. Um, this, ask, this idea of being an astronaut was certainly a goal for them, but I can tell you, of all of those people, if they had never been selected to be astronauts, they would be happy people today doing work that they really enjoy. And it's because they paid attention to the thing, that kind of what they had their passion for, what they wanted, what they were curious about and wanted to learn more about. And that, I think, opens up so many more opportunities for you than trying to fill like the checklist and do things that other people might, or that you think other people might think you need to do to be an astronaut. And so bottom line, study what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. Very good advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take one last question. I hope it's one way that we can... Way over there. Ooh, la la. Oh, no. Okay, right here. He's right here now. Okay, sorry. My question is, Will Mars be ever, Will you be ever able to terraform Mars into a suitable living planet, like just or turn Mars into like a planet like Earth? Ah, so terraform to like Earth. Ah, ah that is a. I think nice. that's one that you all have your opinion about. So let's go <laughs> through the rooms. What do you think? So you're a biotechnologist, so that will be close to your heart, <laughs> not to your heart. <laughs> uh, I I'm not a huge fan of the terraform because. I want to treat the universe and space more like a top of the Everest or in the middle of the Mongolia. We want to go there to have a wonderful time and learning something, training ourselves, and want to go back home to take a warm shower and <laughs> eat my mom's food. So I'm not a huge fan of that, but I believe we can do that. And at some point, we can make at least some base camp or some place to do something further and more. So I hope we will have those kind of time we can have. And also I would love to volunteer for going there as a builder or a person who working for over there. But actually, frankly speaking, I don't know still. Yeah. Bob? Well, I'll be a contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say that I'm an advocate for terraforming. And when I say that, um, I admit that you're asking a very astute question. It's an ethical question. Mm -hmm. Do we want to alter Mars? Uh, a lot of scientists would be upset with us for doing that because once you alter Mars, they can no longer study um, mm -hmm. uh, Mars. However, the big picture is that I don't think that humans are confined to Earth forever. I think Earth is just a cradle. And that years from now, and I'm not talking 10 years from now, I'm talking a hundred or a thousand years from now, humans are going to move out into the inner solar system, and then your great, 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 great grandchildren are going to take a, a spaceship and go to another uh, solar system. 
And so I think it's realistic that as our population expands, that we are going to have uh, colonies uh, on other planets in our solar system and in other so solar systems. The only way we can do that uh, is through terraforming. Nicole, is that also your opinion? I think I'm kind of a mix oh. because, <laughs> sorry, um, because I, I see us as an interplanetary species as well. I see eventually we, we won't just be living on Earth. I think ultimately our, our survival depends on that uh, as well. Um, I don't see us ever abandoning Earth though. I'm, I'm not a fan of this idea that we, you know, we, we've done so much damage here and We've overpopulated so much that we have to get off and uh, otherwise we won't survive. I see us going out into the solar system, uh, going back to the moon and establishing settlements there, going on to Mars and doing the same thing as you know, an extension of our life here on Earth. And, and hopefully as we do that, we're improving, like I believe everything we do in space is about improving life here on Earth as well. There's um, from sci-fi to some of our current uh, uh, space explorers or space developers who, who look at, you know, Earth is this place that we're supposed to live. You know, we live here, we do, our, our industry is off the planet somewhere, so we're not, you know, we're not damaging it in, you know, in some of the ways that we are today. Um, and I think that same thing applies when we go on to Mars or when we go back to the moon, is that we have to look at that place for what it offers us in its current shape. We um, establish our presence there and then we learn from that and figure out how much do we need to do to this place to survive there. And um, I really look forward to the time when you and your children and like Bob said your grandchildren and great-grandchildren are, are where Earth is our home base and, and we're looking at our solar system and beyond as um, a place for humanity. Dan, last word. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I've been thinking about this topic for about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's uh, a tough question. It yeah. is, yeah. When I think of Mars and going to Mars, I, I'm the nerd, so I think of the mechanics and the, the, the mission to go to Mars, and I have not spent a lot of time thinking about the philosophical, you know, what, what does it look like when, uh, when we can send colonies to Mars or to further, and so... I, that, that's, it's a very astute question, and I, I have not really thought of it. It's, I, I, I mean, I've, I guess I've always pictured in my mind that Earth is our home planet, and we will exist other places also, but that Earth will always be home. But, I, you know, that's, that's a, I don't know. That's a really good, that's a good question for ethicists. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, you get up here. Yeah, no, really, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you think? Do you have a microphone? Yeah. All right, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. what do you think? I, I, I think like, we, won't, we won't like leave. Sorry, this is not easy. <laughs> but, not like, too easy, is it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think we will terraform Mars because it, it'll seem complicated with like magnetic fields and everything. I say we might stay on Earth for like hundreds of thousands of years and maybe discover like uh, other planets like light years away from Earth or something, and we might be able to. We might, they might be suitable for living like in a Goldilocks zone. They might be suitable. Study. And we yeah. 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 Oh, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Class. As I, uh, <laughs> can I at this stage before we do a little other chapter I would like to ask you to give a big applause to the yeah. four existing <laughs> and, and of course also to the future astronaut yeah. <laughs> Now a little, a little uh, award ceremony, to, to say so. The Association of Space Explorers, ASE, which is grouping all the astronauts from all over the world, irrespective of their 
political or uh, cultural background, they're all equal in that as association, that's a fantastic association. They, over the last few years, pick out a student from the class or a participant which they think is closest to their vision. Now this year, I will, like in a really Nobel Prize award or a very award, I will read their verdict. Their <laughs> verdict. <laughs> She has shown remarkable motivation and energy in the, in the Antarctic campaign at Concordia. Through her research, this outpost in isolation and darkness can be seen as a true analog to space, helping future spacefarers to better cope with the challenges of their journey. So may I ask Beth Haley, the winner of this year, to come to the podium, please. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. 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 And I promised to the Association of Space Explorers a picture with the astronauts, so if I can have the if we can have the official photographers. So where? Where do you want us? Right here? Come up, let's come up. Come up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Get in the middle there. In the middle. Yeah. It ruins the boy well, girl. Boy in girl. the middle. Yeah. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the middle of five people is a bit difficult. But. Where's the camera? Ah, okay. Strike down the middle. There. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. So with that, I would like to thank you all for these very interesting questions. I'm aware that there were plenty of other questions. Uh, maybe you have a possibility afterwards, uh, or maybe at Personam if you pass by. So I would like to close formally the astronaut panel, and I would like to invite all those who want, maybe they can pass by and uh, greet the astronauts or say a personal word. So the formal session is finished. If those who want to have a word with the astronauts can pass by here and uh, go to the other, uh, maybe if you stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>